he looked at my, uh, they call it your jacket, your file. Jesus Christ, you got 26 years for fraud. Man, your nuts are going to be hanging down by your fucking knees by the time you get out of here. Are, are you fucking serious? Like, this guy's a fucking dick. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and this is part five of my, basically my prison story, what happened once I got sentenced and went to prison. So at this point, you know, in the last video, I, I talked about meeting my cousin and a guy named Jason Weeks and just overall having some issues while I was in prison. But I wanted to backtrack real quick and explain one of the things that you know, unfortunately, I find comical. And that is that when I first got to prison and I met with my counselor, I walked into, you know, I was placed on what's called the call out and I explained that. So, and it said, hey, yeah, I have to meet my, uh, my prisoner. I mean, my prisoner. <laughs> I have to meet, had to meet my counselor. So I met my counselor and I went in there and I remember her name's, her name was Miss Bates. She smoked like a, a chimney. I mean, smoked all the time. Wasn't in great shape. She wasn't like overweight or anything, but she was older. She was probably in her late 40s, early 50s and just smoked nonstop. Even though Coleman was a tobacco-free, um, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, um, building or, or institution, she still smoked all the time. She would go in. She'd constantly walk outside and smoke a cigarette. So – she, she calls me in. She says, okay, hey, Mr. Cox, you have to fill out this piece of paper and this piece of paper. And, and I've already explained that she kind of basically said, I don't even know why you're here. Um, you know, I'm not sure why you're even here. And then she looked and she goes, oh, wow, you've got 26 years. Okay, never mind. Because she said, your, my security level was like a, a two or a three as opposed to, you know, being much higher. If you're over, a, if you're under 10 a level security level of like under like let's say five or something like that. You're supposed to be at a camp unless you have over 10 years to serve on your sentence. I obviously still – by the time I got to Coleman, I still had like 22, 23, 23 years to go. So she was like, hey, I don't even know why you're here. She said, oh, I see you have such a long sentence. That's why you're here. She said, okay, well, you know, I'll probably be sending you in the next three years or so. We'll send you to a – uh, to the low, assuming you don't get your sentence cut or win an appeal or, you know, if I can get it cut or whatever. I said, okay. I said, I understand. And she said, um, also, she said, I see that you owe $6 million. And I went, okay. And she said, so, you know, you owe $6 million. She said, you have to start paying restitution. You have to start paying. It's called the um, FRP. Uh, um, right. So it's a financial um, – financial restitution program or something like that where you – or federal restitution pro program. Anyway, you have to pay. So I'm like, okay, well, I don't have a job and I don't have any money, so I'm not sure how I'm going to pay. And she goes, well, you have to pay. And I went, well, I don't – I'm not supposed to pay anyway. And she goes, why not? And I said, because my lawyer argued in prison – I'm sorry, my – I'm going to have a real hard time here. My lawyer argued at sentencing, at my sentencing, that – I didn't have – I shouldn't have to make restitution payments while I was incarcerated. And I said she argued in front of the judge and she won that argument. And the judge said while he's incarcerated, Mr. Cox doesn't have to um, pay restitution. His restitution will start upon release. Also, I said I'm, I don't have to pay interest on the restitution, which was you know, another thing that she won. I said she only won a couple arguments. Those were them. He once got plastic surgery because he didn't like the photo on his wanted poster. His legend precedes him. The way indictments precede arrests. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. So my counselor is kind of like, she looked through the file, kind of like it was sitting there and she was like, okay, well... I'll check it out and I'll I'll let you know. I'll, I'll look and see. And if that's what it says, then you don't have to pay. But And she said, but in, in the meantime, you have to sign this document, this document, and whatever. So I signed a bunch of documents and she said, I'll let you know as far as the FRP is concerned. That's what they call it. So I said, okay, no problem. 
and I left. By the way, that's completely untrue. Like none of that, like I, I, I was subject to pay my restitution while I was incarcerated. So I end up, um, I end up leaving and then a couple months later, like I don't hear anything for a few months. And then suddenly one day, uh, I heard that, uh, Mrs. Bates, Counselor Bates, my my counselor, um, had died in the middle of the night. Uh, woke up and her husband tried to wake her up and she was dead. Now she had some heart problems and she had she had smoked like nonstop, so she just ended up dying. Uh, so another few months went by, and you're supposed to meet with your counselor like I think it's once every six months or once a year or something. So like six months went by, and I, I ended up with another counselor, and he just randomly called me in. And he asked me about my FRP. Now, I, I should preface this by saying that this was actually what they call a team. So you get teamed like once a year you get teamed. And for I guess I'd been there six months or a year by the time this happened now that I think about it because I remember it was a team. So I go in for what's called team and team is like they basically have your counselors there. Your the unit manager and your your case manager like there are three people that are kind of like over the whole building or unit whatever, and so I go in and I sit down and they they typically have these meetings because they're they kind of they're they're supposedly they're acting like they're trying to rehabilitate you and they say hey have you been to programming have you got your GED did you try and get your high school diploma or, I'm sorry your 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 GED did you try and get your your um your your classes have you got your certificate for whatever class you're trying to take if you're trying to take one like have you thought about becoming a um you know a chef or a, a becoming a farmer whatever classes they're teaching for vocational uh, tech, Votech, they call it. So, you know, you go in there and I walked in, I sat down and I said, Hey, so, uh, what's up? And they went, hi, uh, Mr. Cox, you know, we were, this is team. And they explain it. And I knew that. And they were like, okay. So they start flipping through and keep in mind, I've got like 23, 22, 23 years left. So I really don't care about team. Like I have bigger problems. I'm going to move this forward. So I have bigger problems so I say, okay, what's up? And they kind of go through, oh, okay, well, yeah, you get a lot of time, Cox. Yeah, this and that. And, then, and as they're looking through the papers, one of them says, hey, I see here that you're not paying FRP, but you're not on, you're not on FRP refusal. So what happens is sometimes, you know, guys are responsible or, or have to pay like whatever, 50 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month. Keep in mind, you've got a job. You have a job at the prison that pays you $18 or something or 12 bucks or maybe if you work for Unicor you might make 100 bucks or maybe $200 at most and they'll literally charge you 50 or 100 bucks. So you'll be making $18 a month and they're charging you $50 a month and if you can't pay the 50, they put you on FRP refusal. And then they don't they only let you go to commissary to buy stuff like soap and shampoo. I mean like it's like you can't buy anything, you can't buy coffee, you can't buy anything. And then, of course, the other thing that they do, which is comical, is like if you can't pay FRP refusal, if you're placed on FRP refusal, they knock you down from what you can pay, what you can be paid. So if you're being paid twenty five, or let's say you're being paid eighty five cents an hour, they'll knock you down to like twelve cents an hour. You know, these are all punishments. So you're gonna make me now. I'm making. I can't pay the fifty dollars a month. So now you're gonna charge me. You're now going to let me only make $12 an hour. It's – I'll never be able to pay the $50 now. So anyway, I go in and they go, well, it's funny. You're supposed to be – it looks like you're supposed to be paying FRP, but you're not on FRP refusal. What's going on? And I said, no, no, I'm not supposed to pay FRP. I said, I, I, not while I'm incarcerated. And the, my counselor looks at me and he goes, well – you, ha you 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 owe six million dollars. I said, yeah, I know, but and I explain about my me my lawyer arguing at sentencing I shouldn't have to pay, and um, that she'd won the argument. And then the the case manager looks at me, and I'm you know I'm so convincing when I tell them that when I say this that and I say and I look at them, they look at me and they go really I've never heard that. I said, bro, I said Miss Bates looked into it. That's why she never put me into the system to make the payments. Like, because the payments automatically come out. 
And I said, that's why I was never put in the system. But I wasn't actually put in the system because Miss Bates said she was going to look into it. And I guess she never did. And then she died. So it just never got entered into the system. She was probably thinking when I when he comes up for his six months review, I'll talk to him about it. And I'll have to have it done by that point. But she died. So I sat there and I looked at him. I said, yeah, I said, that's why she never put me in the system. She didn't really know what to do. She said, well, I, OK, well, yo, six million. But you're right. But you're right. She looked at looked into it and she said, yeah, you're right. There's not an order for you to pay. And as a result, I said, she didn't put me in the system. And so he looked at me and you could tell they were very skeptical of what I was saying. So they kind of looked at me and they went, well, we'll look into it. I said, OK, cool. And I, I, and I, I remember that they had my file there. My file was thick. And I said, my, I go, it's in my file. They all kind of glanced at the file and they said, we'll check it out. We'll let you know. I said, OK, no problem. And I got up and I left. Listen, most inmate files, inmates files are not that big. But I had a ton of paperwork attached to me. I had a ton of fraud and there's all kinds of stuff in my file. And these people are lazy. So I get up and I leave and I really kind of thought, okay, well, he'll catch it in a month or so or a week or two days. He's going to call me back. So months go by and months go by and months go by. Six months later, I've got a new counselor. He calls me in just, just to call me in. His name is like his name's like Mr. Lopez or Gonzalez or something. I remember he's Spanish. So I walk and I said, yeah, what's up? And he says, hey, it's your six-month review. So he looks through my stuff and says, how you doing? What are you doing? I said, oh, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. He said, okay. How's everything going? He said, I'm not going to ask you about taking classes or this or that because he said, you got so much time, Cox. He said, if you start taking classes now, you'd be done with them all in a couple of years. He said, I, I'm not going to bug you. I said, no problem. He said, I do have a question about FRPs. I noticed that you have FRP. You owe FRP, but you're not on refusal. What's up with that? And I said, okay, what happened was, and I explained about Miss Bates not putting me on FRP because I didn't have technically have to pay it. And he goes, okay, okay. He goes, well, you can pay it if you want to. I said, I don't, man, I owe $6 million. I said, I got enough problems. I said, I can't. What am I going to do? I said, how am I going to pay that off? 50 bucks a month? 100 bucks a month? Come on, man. I don't even make 100 bucks a month. At that point, I was teaching GED. I had actually been hired by the, uh, I'd been hired by the library or the education department to be a GED tutor. So I'm like, I'm like, how am I? Come on, man. I, I don't even make that. I can't make that much. I don't make that much money. And, you know, and he was like, okay, okay. That, I, I get it. He said, um, yeah, that's odd. I've never seen that. I said, man, it's in my file. You can check. He goes, I will. I'll check it out. I'll let you know what, what I come up with. He said, that sounds weird though. He said, sounds odd. He goes, you sure? And I go, come on, bro. I said, I just had team. I said that we had the same conversation at team and my last counselor checked. He said it was fine. He said he agreed. And he goes, OK, well, I'll check it out. I said, OK, no problem. I get up and I leave. I'm waiting for the call, right? I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Nothing ever happens. Six more months go by. I get another team. They all come in. And as I'm sitting there talking and the counts, the, the case manager now says, hey, Cox, I noticed you're not paying FRP. What's up with that? And I look at the other counselor and I said, he looked into it. I said, I don't have to pay. This keeps coming up, but I don't have to pay. And my counselor said, yeah, it's a weird. He doesn't have to pay. It's, it's odd. But yeah, it turns out that uh, the judge in his case said he didn't have to pay while he's incarcerated. Now, keep in mind, that's absolutely untrue. Yet the guy said, OK, no problem. And then that was it. So I never... Like every team, it would kind of come up, but then it, then it just didn't come up anymore. Like I stopped hearing about it. While this is happening, like this, you know, I'm, at this point, I'm now teaching the real estate class. There was a guy there by the name of Barrington. His real name was something like Michael Sneed. And he changed his name because he'd gone to prison, got out, changed his – legally changed his name. He was a con man and started running some kind of a real estate scam. He then got in trouble again, but he had changed his name by this time to like Michael or – oh, I think it was John Barrington. So he changed it from like Michael Sneed to like John Barrington. And I mean just – this guy was like a real con man. So he would run a huge scam, got in trouble again. Uh, I think he went to trial or – I'm not sure I should look that up. But anyway, he got a bunch of time, was in prison, and he was teaching the real estate class. So he was – he didn't want to teach real estate anymore because he was now doing legal work for other inmates and charging. 
which you're not allowed to do, but that's fine. He was, that's what he was doing. So he was charging them and he didn't want to do real estate anymore. So he came to me and he said, hey, Cox, would you mind doing the real estate class? He said, somebody needs to take it over. I said, sure, no problem. So I start teaching the real estate class. Well, as soon as I start teaching the real, first of all, the real estate class was, it was pretty packed. I mean, it was packed like, there was probably 30 people the first class. Well, after the first or second class, guys are coming up to me saying, listen, Cox, like, I don't really want to take this class. And I'd say, okay. And they'd say, but I need the certificate because my counselor wants me to t get, take classes like this. So I get a certificate. So it lowers their custody level so they can go from, let's say, the medium down to a low. And they're trying to get to like a camp. All these guys are trying to get to a camp for some reason. I mean, I know what the reason is, but the reason is that they can get cell phones very easily. They can get drugs very easily and they can see their girlfriends or sneak off, sneak away from the camps and go see their girlfriends or whatever the case may be. So I say, okay, I get it. Uh, you don't want to take the class. I said, there's a test, there's this, there's that. And I said, how about this? How about you give me two coffees and two creamers and I'll fill out all the paperwork and I'll mark you as being here the whole time. And uh, yeah. So that empties out the class pretty quickly. It gets down to maybe, I don't know, maybe there's maybe 10 or 15 guys within a few, within a month. Well, the thing is, I really took the, the real estate class seriously. The guys that were there genuinely thought they were all going to get out and become, you know, some kind of a real estate, um, not guru, but a, a real estate, uh, a re what they call rehabbers, um, which is somebody who renovates houses, you know, flippers, pick up, buy a house cheap, fix it up, sell it. So they all felt like they were going to do that, you know. Um, which is so funny too, because like drug dealers in general are such hustle, such natural hustlers that if any of them really applied themselves to flipping property and did it right, correctly, like they would probably be really good at it because they genuinely are hustlers. So it was like, and, and I used to pitch that, that look, this is something that you guys are, are really designed for. You'll, you're willing to go into these bad neighborhoods. You're willing to buy these properties. You're willing to risk your money. You're willing to hustle to get guys to fix them up and sell them. And so I would I taught a really serious class, and I took it from the very beginning of what makes real estate real estate. Why is it able to be bought and sold? How is it titled? How are you able to borrow money on it? Um, what you need to look for as far as in public records, what you need to look for in uh, zoning, like the whole thing. I went all the way through to actually building houses. It's a great class. Within this, by the next semester, there's like 40 people showing up. Maybe five or 10 of them don't really want the, to take the class. Um, and keep in mind, I'm, I'm not like a really sweet person. Like I don't, have a, a, I, I don't have a super bullshit personality. Like I'm pretty, I pretty much just tell people how it is. And so I, I very much spoke to these guys. Like I, I, it wasn't, I didn't sugarcoat anything. And I, I just, you know, and I went through the process and I broke it down very simply so that they could understand it. So they loved the real estate class. So the real estate class got to a point where guys were literally sitting in the class over and over. There was actually a, probably a few quarters where there were so many people there were standing up and I had to actually ask guys, go around the room and say, how many people are actually on the raw, on the roster? Like I had to make people get out of their seats and stand, switch with people that were actually on the class roster because guys were just coming and just standing there. And eventually as the classes go on, you know, people drop out. So if you start with 40, you know, a month into it, a month and a half into it, it drops down to maybe 30. And really there was only 30 chairs in the, in the room. There are still guys standing up. Guys are bringing in chairs from other rooms. It got so bad at one point I started teaching two classes. I taught a, a Tuesday and a Thursday class. So this goes on and on and on. Uh, and, and, and keep in mind, I, I'm, not, I'm no longer – I don't have to buy coffee and creamer anymore. And not just that. It was funny because after the second – probably second or third semester, it got to the point where guys were getting up, walking out of the class and stopping me and shaking my hand. Like that was bizarre. Guys are literally like walking up as they're walking out. They're like, hey, Cox, um, good class, bro. Like, I, uh, man, it was a good class. 
and they shake my hand. And I would be like, uh, hey, okay. Like, it got to the point where four or five guys, every single class are shaking my hand. Man, it was a good class, bro. Good class. Like, it was just a thing. It was, it was, you know, it was, com- it's comical in a way, but in a way, it was the first time I think any of these guys really genuinely got educated in a way that they understood and they truly believed they could pull off being a real estate rehabber. So, uh, and I think that anybody genuinely really was trying to teach them that wasn't, let's say, a, a paid person by the prison, trying to get them to do something that they really didn't even want to do. Anyway, there was a waiting list on that that class. There ended up being a months and uh, really, sorry, semesters or quarters. They caught it in quarters. So quarters worth of, of people lined up, two, three quarters long. Guys would get upset because they they were going to be transferred or go home before they could take my class. It was – it's just ridiculous. Like, it's ridiculous. But for some, they, for some reason, they just loved it. And I actually had guys who were like getting transferred and they would come to me and they would say, look, can you meet me like on Saturday for two hours and I'll pay you to meet me. And so I would – privately meet guys in the library and teach them and one time I even had like three guys who I would met them for like a month straight and just taught them like a, a class and I gave them the syllabus and I they took notes and everything um okay so there's that and about the same time I was contacted by a I ended up getting contacted by the producers of a TV show called American Greed. I, did I go over this? I don't think I went over this, so I'm going to go over this. So I get contacted by uh, by American Greed, uh, whatever, I, the producers of American Greed, they contact me. We contact, I contact my lawyer. My lawyer says she was contacted by the U.S. attorney. U.S. attorney says, hey, I want Cox to be interviewed by American Greed. That's fine. So I end up getting interviewed by American Greed. And I'm, they bring me down to the warden's office and I'm interviewed in the warden's office or the assistant's warden's office, whatever, somewhere down there. And they actually sit down with me and I get interviewed for like two days straight for like a couple hours at a time. And then they end up doing that. It's funny too because when you listen to – if you watch American Greed, they did like a one-hour special. I probably am not on American Greed for more than five minutes of me talking. Maybe, maybe five minutes. So, um, but I was interviewed for like an hour or two at least. Yeah, maybe an hour or two, maybe an hour and a half one day, an hour the next day. I don't know, a while. It was a while. So, uh, and, and I did that because the U.S. attorney told my attorney she would consider that substantial assistance and she would reduce my sentence for doing it. So, I end up calling my attorney after American Greed airs. It aired months later. Uh, in 2009, it aired. So in late 2009 or mid-2009, whatever, it airs. I'm excited. I call my attorney. I said, hey, I heard that you uh, American Greed aired. And I knew it aired because when I was walking around the compound, like what I would – I would go walking somewhere, the COs would see me and they would say, hey, Cox – Where's that money, Cox? Where'd you put that money? And I'd go, what? Like this happened for like three days straight. So finally, one of the cop, one of the cops looked at me and he goes, "Hey, Cox," he said, "Seen you last night." He said something like, "Hey, I seen you last night." And I went, "On what? What do you? What?" And he goes, "On American Greed." Yeah, he said, I, "We all saw it. it. It aired a couple days ago." I was like, "Holy shit!" So I knew it had aired. I called my attorney. It aired. Oh my gosh. I'm going to get my sentence cut. Uh, did you call the U.S. attorney? So she called. She said, I'll call the U.S. attorney. Uh, she calls the U.S. attorney. And I call her back a couple days later. Call her a couple days later. She keeps – so eventually I get her back on the phone again. And she says, yeah, um, she's not returning my call. This goes on for like a month or so. So finally, after – Oh, my God. Excuse me. After a month or so, she finally gets her on the phone and she says – or no, she didn't get on the phone. She finally actually tracked her down. Remember, she said she went into an elevator she was in and said, you're not returning my calls. What's going on with Mr. Cox's sentence? He did the program. He did Dateline. I was interviewed by Dateline, which they didn't give me anything for. And he was just interviewed by American Greed. We need you. Uh, uh, you said you'd reduce his sentence. She goes, I know. She said, but honestly, Millie, she goes, it's just not enough. My lawyer's name was Millie. She goes, 
it's just not enough. She goes, I just can't justify reducing his sentence because he was interviewed by someone. Like, you told me to be interviewed. You said you'd reduce my sentence. She knew up front she wasn't going to do it. Just like she knew up front being interviewed by Dateline wasn't – they weren't going to do anything. Okay, fine. So, you know, and you're not going to get anything in writing from these people. So I'm – you know, I talked to my lawyer and she's on the phone and she says, Matt, I'm so sorry. I don't know what to say. I really thought she would do it. And I'm like, well, we have to file something. She says, there's just nothing you can do. So I get off the phone with her and it turns out that roughly at the same time, now I've now been locked up at the institution in Coleman, the medium security prison. I've been locked up coming up on three years. My mother would come see me every two weeks. You know, um, I'm teaching the real estate class. I'm teaching GED. Uh, I, I had a buddy of mine, his name is Zach. Uh, I've had him on the program a bunch of times. Um, you know, I've got some buddies uh, at that point, my cousin, like I hang out with a few guys, but three years is coming up and I end up going into my counselor's office because my counselor called me one day and I go and I go in there and my counselor says, I got good news. And I said, what's that? He said, you're below 20 years. At this point, you have 20 years remaining on your sentence. And I went, okay. He said, and we have to move you to the low. So for three years, as I finally got like a good routine, you know, like I'm finally in a good place where I'm, I got some friends, you know, and my expectations of life at this point have been lowered so low that just being able to find a good book and meet people that I can talk to and walk the rec yard and kind of have a routine down where you weren't miserable all the time was a a huge comfort for me. So when this guy tells me he wants to move me to the low, I'm like, I don't want to go. I absolutely don't want to go to the low. But, you know, and I actually ran around and I tried to get people, I tried to talk to some some of the like my counselor, I tried to talk to the unit manager, I tried to call, talk to my case manager, I tried to talk to um, the, the guy that I worked for, his name was Harmon uh, at the edu- in education. And like basically like they were all like, I'll call, I'll see what I can do. But all of them came back was like, Cox, hey, can you come here? I'm like, yeah, what's up? They look, I called so-and-so and they, like the, you, you have to go. Like one, you're under 20 years and two, you're, you're – Um, your security level is like nothing. Like you came in with like two points, you know, two or three points. Like you should be at a camp. Like they can't keep you here. If you got hurt here, that would be an issue. Like you can't be here any longer. He once conned Bank of America out of $250,000 using nothing but a fake ID and his charm. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. So I end up getting transferred to the low security prison. And the nice thing about the medium was you're actually in a cell with like one other guy. Some of the some of the some of the cells had three men in them. They have like a three-man bunk bed. And you I went to the you know, but I had a two-man bunk. I had a two-man room because I'd been there so long. Very quickly, I ended up getting moved to a two-man cell. I had a celly that wasn't a bad guy. He was, um, he was a Mexican gang member, uh, nice guy, you know. Uh, and uh, but yeah, he, uh, his name was Victor, and Victor had done. Victor shot a guy. Victor was one. He was in the United States illegally. Two. He shot a guy in the head and he got, I think he got 13 years in like Arizona or something. I think he did seven years on it. He then got grabbed by the feds when he got out of prison and the feds gave him like 10 years for reentry. And he was going to end up doing a few more months on the federal reentry sentence than he did on the Arizona attempted murder where he shot the guy in the head. Like it was attempted murder, not because he didn't, because he, but not because he didn't even shoot the guy. The guy just didn't die. Like if the guy died, it would have been murder. Instead, he got attempted murder. Like it, So anyway, 
he was a nice guy. Uh, I mean, we had some issues when we first he first uh, we, he first uh, moved into my cell. We butted heads a little bit, but it wasn't a big deal. Um, like he thought he was going to bully me or something like that. But the truth is, we were both about the same height, and and I he actually got into several fights while he was there. And I was like, listen, bro, you're like you've gotten your shit kicked out of you twice. I'm not worried. And so I think he thought he was going to move in my cell and force me out of the cell so he could move some another gang member in. And he probably tried for about a month or two. And then eventually he just he just realized he wasn't going to be able to do it. So we, we started getting along. Um, what else? Yeah, that's it. So then I, I got moved to the low. Yeah, I got moved to the low. And the low wasn't bad. Like it sucked because when I got to the low, there's something called – um. They have what's what are called – it's an open bay. They're just a dorm, one big room with a bunch of concrete block dividers between the cells. And you have two- and three-man cells, and there's just – the walls only go up about five feet. There's no doors. That's it. There's three beds, sometimes two beds, in a little cubicle, concrete block cubicle with – and everybody's got a locker. And it it absolutely sucks. I mean – there's never it's never quiet. That's the nice thing about at least in the medium you had a, a you had your own cell and you could close the door and it was quiet. It was never quiet in the low. There was just screaming and hollering all the time. Um, yeah, I think I think maybe I'm gonna end the video now and I'll do the the next video will be about uh, when I got to the low. So basically, I went to the low. I got to the low in this video. I guess I said what I'm gonna. Another video I said I was going to the low. So basically, I, yeah, I went to the low. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. This is funny. This is what it was. So I went to the low. Like literally they pack up your bag. I pack up all my bags. You have to think it's the Coleman complex has five prisons. There was a, there was a female camp. There, were, there was a low security prison, a medium security prison, and two penitentiaries. So they literally, you pack up all your bags and then you get placed in a van and you get driven across the parking lot and then unloaded and processed at the low. My boxes full of my bags and my legal work and all my stuff, all my documents, all my clothes, everything that I had. It took a month for it to get across the street. That's how efficient the Bureau of Prisons is. So I get to the low and my, I get called into my counselor's office. And his name was Counselor Smith. He was a fat redneck. And the, so at the low, at the medium, the, the guards are kind of respectful, you know, semi-respectful. Like you would think that at, the, at a camp, guards would be really respectful to you. And at the low, they'd be a little bit more and like, or sorry, a little bit less. Like the higher you go up in custody level, the meaner the guards would be. And it's actually the opposite. At the pen, guards are really respectful to the inmates because these guys have life sentences and they're violent and they'll attack you or, or they'll attack a guard. At the medium, it's kind of the same thing, but they can get a little mouthy with a guy at the medium. At the low, they know the low, like you're nonviolent typically, and they'll mouth off to you and they'll be sarcastic. And then at the camp, they'll talk to you like you're a dog because they know you're so happy to be at a camp. You wouldn't dare do anything violent or say anything back to a guard to get written up because you don't want to be moved from the camp to the low or to the, whatever. So my point is I get there. I realize right away that the fucking COs are all assholes. My counselor's an asshole, Counselor Smith. And I remember when I sat down, he looked at my – he looked at my uh, – they call it your jacket, your file. So he looked at my jacket and he goes – he looked in my, in my jacket and he, he goes, Jesus Christ, you got 26 years for fraud. And I went, yeah. And he goes, man, your nuts are going to be hanging down by your fucking knees by the time you get out of here. And I just was like oh. – I, I couldn't – I mean it was like just such a – it was just like, Jesus, I couldn't believe he said that. So I was like, wow, because like none of the other guards would say something like that. They Typically they'd be like, wow, man, that's a lot of time. This guy, he goes, he goes, man, he goes, you're not – he said, you're not going to have a piece of pussy. He said, by the time you get a piece of ass, he said, I don't think you'll even be able to get it up. And I mean, I'm just sitting there like, are, are you fucking serious? Like, this guy's a fucking dick. And he's laughing about it. And I'm like, Jesus. And I go, well, 
Well, I, I mean, hopefully that's not what happens. He goes, doesn't look like anything's happening. Looks like you're going to do all that time. And I went, okay, well, yeah, thanks. Uh, okay. So anyway, what's up, bro? I said, all right, so what am I here for? He goes, okay, well, listen, man. He said, um, you know, he gave me a, assigned me a, a, they call them cells, but a cubicle. He assigned me a bed. And I'm like, all right. And then he says, uh, okay, what's up with your FRP, man? You're supposed to be paying FRP. And I went, no, I'm not. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, yeah. I said, look in my jacket, bro. I said, uh, I went through this with Counselor Bates. I went through this with Rodriguez. I went through this with Lopez. I went through this with my counselor, uh, Johnson. I went through this with, you know, Thompson. Like, I've been through this with everybody. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, the problem is I said that I I – I don't have to pay while I'm incarcerated. My, my lawyer argued in front of the judge, and the judge agreed that while I was incarcerated, he, I didn't have to pay. So I don't have to pay. I said, I also don't have to pay the interest on it. And I said, you can t I said, I said, trust me, it's been three years. You think I haven't paid in three years and nobody's caught it? I said, I'm not on FRP refusal. And he looked. He goes, yeah, I noticed that. He goes, all right, well, I'll check it out. I'll let you know. I said, all right. So that's it. Um, the next day, I go to my case manager's office. Her name is Miss Jenkins, and everybody says Miss Jenkins is the devil. Miss Jenkins was a six foot tall black woman who hated all inmates. I had heard that she was in the Atlanta prison when it was. When it was, there was a riot one time and that Miss Jenkins had been raped by inmates. Now, I don't know if that's true. That's what all the inmates said about her and that they said that's why she hated inmates. They also, I also had heard that her sister was, had worked for the BOP as a, uh, as a CO, which is where Miss Jenkins started, and that her sister had fallen in love with an inmate. The inmate had left prison. She quit her job to be with the inmate because th they can't they can't have contact with inmates after prison. So she quit her job, hooked up with this guy. They ended up getting married or lived together, and then the guy cheated on her, left her, and then she was no longer allowed to be hired by the BOP, and now she worked at like some horrible, shitty job somewhere. So Miss Jenkins hated inmates. According to what the other inmates said, I have no idea whether that, any of that's true. Regardless, she definitely hated inmates. So I got in there, and I remember getting in her office – and she was the same way as Smith. Like she told me, you know, after looking at your file and seeing what you what you've done and all the crimes you've committed, she said, I I, I think they should have strung you up by the flagpole. And I went, Well, thank God they don't do that anymore. And she said, Well, you're pretty cocky. She said, Listen, uh, I just I, I don't know what you think you've got coming. I said, I don't think I have anything coming. I said, I think that you told me to come in here. Like I could tell, like she was just combative. And she looked at me and she was, and she just kind of sneered at me. And she said, uh, she, she goes, God, just, she was just you sitting here makes me want to hide my credit cards. And I went, your credit cards. I said, I'm, I'm not going to steal your credit cards. I said, I'll take your whole house. And she, and she was like, she, I remember she just kind of reared back and she said, whatever. She said, listen, Cox, she said, you know, you got so much time. She said, I'm not going to bug you right now about taking any classes or anything. I said, all right. She said, I see you taught the real estate class next door. She said, so just if you, if there's a real estate class check, she goes, maybe you can teach it here. I don't know. She said, that's up to you. She says, but why aren't you paying your FRP? That's what I want to know. You're not on an FRP refusal, but you owe FRP. What's going on? Just then counselor Smith walked in. So he walks in and I go, ask him. And I said, he asked me the same question. I said, I, I, I said, I already explained this. I don't have to pay FRP. And he says, yeah, I looked in his file. It's weird. Uh, apparently, he said he, the judge said he doesn't have to pay it. Um, he won some motion that he had argued or something, which he got it completely wrong. Like, I didn't win a motion. I told, I told him that I, I won the the argument at sentencing. He was, ah, they filed, he and his lawyer, they filed some motion. He won, his lawyer won some motion or something. He doesn't have to pay FRP while he's incarcerated. He said, which sounds to me like he'll never have to pay it because he's got 20 years to go. 
he said, so yeah, it's weird. And she goes, she goes, you checked it out? And, and he goes, yeah, yeah, I checked it. He didn't check anything because that's absolutely untrue. So I remember thinking, yes. And I go, can you make a notation? Because it said, this keeps coming up. I said, my fear is one of you guys is going to put me on FRP. And I'm going to get my, – my, my account's going to be frozen and I'm not going to be able to go, go, go to commissary or something. I said, I mean, honestly, can you – she goes, I'll make a notation, Cox. And she goes and she notes my file. Well, she said she noted my file, that I didn't have to pay FRP. Now, that's what she said she did. Now, reason – there's one reason that I think she did do that and there's another reason why I think maybe she didn't. But regardless, I'll get to that later. The point is is that he verifies that I don't have to pay FRP and I was thrilled thrilled because at this point the only money i've got coming in is money i made was making at my ged class and that was it my mother at this point i think had sent me 50 dollars. like i didn't ask her for money had never asked her for any money even though she was constantly saying do you need money do you want me to send you money do you want me to? and i was like no 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 because i had a job um and i was also i had a job and i was teaching real estate and i was hustling at my real estate so I was making money there getting commissary. You don't actually get, you know, actual like money. It's commissary. So but now I'm in the low. I have no job and I don't know what to do. I'm not teaching the real estate class. So now my mother has to send me money. So the last thing I want to do is have my mother send me money and then take that money to pay FRP, which they'll do. Anyway, so now I know I don't have to pay FRP, at least until they figure this out, which was pretty – which was honestly – Great. I'll tell you what happens after that. At this point, by the way, I'm going – now I'm at the low, and at the low, that's when things start happening. Like that's when I start interviewing guys. That's when I start getting guys into – I get a bunch, I get some guys into Rolling Stone magazines. I, I meet Ephraim Devaroli, which is the guy from uh, – that was in War Dogs. I write his memoir, uh, 